Heavenly Father, we ask once again that you would guide and instruct us of uh, your will through this study. We ask that uh, whatever it takes to awaken us to these truths, that you would make that happen in our lives. We ask that you would put a love in us that uh, constrains us to go out to our friends, our neighbors, and those people that we don't know and give this final warning message. Um, Awaken us to our responsibility individually to prepare and our responsibility to take this warning message far and wide. And we thank you for the opportunity to understand these things at this point in history as we recognize that very few of your people seem to be awakening to these truths. Thank you for calling us in spite of who and what we are. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> when, when I was putting this particular study together, and, and the title to this is Foundational Logic, Rome Establishes the Vision, I knew that I believe that this is going to be a little bit tricky in terms of listening audience because I want to go through in this presentation and the following one and identify um, the understandings of Rome in the books of Daniel and Revelation that allow us to have the tools necessary to see what's going on with the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet here at the end of the world. And our first verse. Um, Daniel 8, 11, 14, Daniel eleven fourteen says, In those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. And as I've stated before on this verse and in past presentations, I never really understood the history of this verse. Um, and I don't know where I came to understand personally that the robbers of thy people in this verse was Rome. But it was just one of those things that I had an understanding of that I assumed every Seventh-day Adventist had an understanding of until until we were in an interaction in a a series of meetings over a few days where a a theologian from the General Conference was sharing his understanding of Daniel 11 and then answering questions, and then we'd share ours and answer some questions. And when he got to this verse, uh, he pointed out that the robbers of thy people here um, is one of the last Syrian kings. And I, I just thought, wow, I'd never heard that before. And, uh, and of course, I disagreed with it because the, the, the point that, un, that establishes Daniel and Revelation's vision at the end is the robbers of thy people. That's what it says. The robbers of thy people establish the vision. The key to understanding the final prophetic vision is the robbers of thy people, whoever they are, and I believe they were Rome. And uh, so... Um, is it straight? Uh, the, this brother introduced the idea that it was Antiochus Epiphanes. And shortly thereafter, I realized that one of, one of the arguments that William Miller made in his day and age, and there is not that many arguments that William Miller publicly records. I mean, you get the writings, the sermons of William Miller, you realize there are certain issues that he dealt with, but he did, we don't have William Miller's understanding on every point in Daniel and Revelation. There are just certain ones. And he, in his experience, had to refute the old Protestant position that the robbers of thy people, in verse 14 of Daniel 11, was not Antiochus Epiphanes. He insisted that it was Rome. And his argument was, if you look very carefully at the preceding verses, verses 12 and 13 that lead up to verse 14, the subject is the king of the north, one of the last Syrian kings. The king of the north is is symbolizing in these verses one of the last Syrian kings. And verse 14 is just a continuation of a thought. This king of the north, one of the last Syrian kings, is making plans to invade Egypt, the king of the south. So when you get to verse 14, it says, "In in, in those times, in that history, when the king of the north, the last Syrian king, is getting ready to attack Egypt, the king of the south. In those times, there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Not just the Syrian king. Other people are going to stand up against Egypt. Also, the robbers of thy people. And this word also, this is where William Miller made his argument. He says the fact that this word also here is in there, this is in introducing a new player. Syria has been under discussion for several verses. 
Egypt's been under discussion for several verses. The fact that it says, also the robbers of thy people, whoever the robbers of the people is, it can't be Egypt and it can't be Syrian kings. That's William Miller's logic, and it's sound. It's sound. The robbers of thy people have to be a new player. And then William Miller goes on to say, who is it in the book of Daniel that exalts himself and falls? It's Rome. Rome establishes the vision. So when we have this pioneer position, understanding, theme, and we approach the different verses in Daniel and Revelation that deal with the subject, um, we come to different conclusions than if we don't. And one of those is the daily. You'll see Daniel 12, 11, and 12 there. that says, And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there should be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he who waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and thirty-five days. And then in verse 31 of Daniel 11, it says, An arm shall stand in his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Both places in the, these two passages that, are, that say take away are the Hebrew word sir, it means remove. These, both of these, all three of these verses are talking about when the daily is removed, when paganism is removed. And then in the next quote, sacrifice and paganism. From early writings, we've read this more than once already, Sister White is clear that the word sacrifice uh, doesn't belong to the text and that those that gave the judgment hour cry were correct in their understanding of the daily. And all you have to do is go back to the write, published writings and sermons of those that gave the judgment our cry to find that they believe the daily represented paganism. So if we insert those truths into these verses we just read, then they would read like this. And from the time that paganism shall be taken away, removed. And then the two time prophecies are identified, 12, 9, 13, 35. And in verse 31, it says, An arm shall stand on his part, they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away paganism. Remember, they're removed, sir, that's what it means. They're not uh, roomed, lifted up, and exalted here. They're removed. So from the time that paganism should be removed, and uh, that time period, according to the pioneers, um, is 508. Now, brothers and sisters, the, the logic of, of Daniel and Revelation is this. Based upon Daniel 7, and you'll notice that the the subject of the daily in the book of Daniel starts in Daniel 8, and you find it in Daniel 11 and Daniel 12. Following prophecies repeat and enlarge previous prophecies. And if you're going to understand the daily, then you need to start in Daniel 7. And in Daniel 7, there are 10 kingdoms that come out of the Roman Empire that, that is ultimately... Seven of those European kings are going to come into a church-state relationship with the papacy, and one of the things that they will accomplish for the papacy, and it's only one of the things that they accomplish for the papacy, is that they're going to remove the Uruli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals, these three horns, in order to place the little horn that we call the papacy. The church-state relationship that was began by Clovis in 496 was repeated by each of these seven European kings. The last to do so was King Arthur in the year 508. As Clovis came into a church-state relationship with the papacy, he took, and this is, this thought is harder for Americans to understand than other, other nationalities. In the United States, we very specifically do not have a national religion but most of the countries in the world have a national religion. So they understand this concept. They understand that their country has a specific legal religion that is their country's legal religion. And back in, the, in this history, all the countries operated that way. And when Clovis um, converted to Catholicism, he didn't simply, as the king of France, come into a church-state relationship with the papacy. He changed legally the religion of France from paganism to Catholicism. And as each of these European kings repeated the church-state combination that Clovis began, by the year 508, one of the things that they had accomplished is that paganism had been removed as the legal religion from every one of these seven European kingdoms. And by the year 508, 
paganism had been stirred, it had been removed, it had been taken away. That's, that's the historical reality of the removing of the daily, the removing of paganism. And that's why when you get to uh, Daniel 12, 11, and it says from the time that paganism shall be removed, it's talking about a time. What's the time? The year 508? There shall be 1,290 days. Uh, that ends in 1798. And then it says, Blessed is he who cometh to the 1335. That ends in 1843. This is the 1,290 days of verse 11. This is the 1,335 days of verse 12, both of Daniel 12. So there is, in connection with the daily, there is a time prophecy and a history involved, and there is also an action revol involved. In Daniel 11.31, it says, these arms, these seven European kings, shall take away paganism. This is the, the action that took place from 496 until 508. This truth is identified several places in prophecy. Uh, on page 39 now, we're moving forward in your notes at the top. You see the title, Three Things Plucked Up. And the, and the reason that I, say, that I suggest it that way is there's a, just a little kind of play on words that are worth you know, taking note of. There's three horns taken away for the papacy, but in Revelation 13, 2, there are three things given to the papacy. If you, keep, if you keep that in your mind, it gives you a little key to tie some of these histories together. The three things that were taken away are the, the Vandals, the Hurali, and the Ostrogoths. When the Goths, the third of these three, was finally removed, when was it that the Goths, the final horn was removed? When was that? 538. So the removing of the third horn is what starts what? The 1260 years of papal rule. Um, the removing of the three horns is identifying the starting point for the 1260 and the process of the seven European kings changing their religion from paganism to Catholicism is identifying the process that these seven European kings in Daniel 7 came into a relationship with the papacy where they were willing to make war with these three powers in order to place the papacy on the throne of the earth. There's a connection there. And on the top of page 39, it says three things plucked up, and it has the verses in Daniel that deal with the removing of the three horns. And then it says three things given. And uh, underneath three things given, you see the dragon. And Sister White says, thus while the dragon primarily represents Satan, it is in a secondary sense a symbol of pagan Rome. In Revelation 12, and Revelation 12 doesn't just stop in Revelation 12. Revelation 12 goes right on into Revelation 13. In Revelation 12, the dragon is specifically identified as Satan. And in great controversy here, this is just one sentence where Sister White's speaking about the dragon in Revelation 12. And she says, yeah, the dragon in Revelation 12 is Satan, just as Revelation 12 says it is. But in a secondary sense, it is pagan Rome. So when we have that established, that in Revelation 12, the dragon is Satan and its earthly manifestation of power was carried out through the, the nation, the kingdom that we call pagan Rome. Then when we get into Revelation 13, 2, which is just a continuation of, cha of chapter 12, v Revelation 13, 2 says, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and his great authority. Who's the dragon? The dragon is pagan Rome. And in verse 2, Pagan Rome gives the papacy three things. Pagan Rome, these seven European kings, they have taken away three things for the papacy, the Heruli, the Vandals, the Ostrogoths, but they're going to give three things to the papacy. They're going to give their power to the papacy. And when did they give their power to the papacy? They gave their power to the papacy from the year 496 through 508, and beyond. These seven European kings 
were still giving their military and economic support to the papacy all the way through the Dark Ages. That's what the church-state relationship of the Dark Ages was about. That they came into the church-state relationship from 496 to 508. Power represents military and economic power. From 496 to 508, the church-state relationship was established. The seven European kings had given their power under the papacy, and it remained in that state until 1798. Pagan Rome also gave its seat to the papacy, and it did this in the year 330 when Constantine moved the capital of the empire from the city of Rome to the city of Constantinople, and pagan Rome also gave its civil authority to the papacy in the year 533, when Justinian made a legal decree and when the pioneers of Adventism deal with this history, when they deal with the decree of Justinian in 533, invariably the pioneers will include almost the whole decree in their, in their article. It was that significant in their mind. In 533, in the midst of a political crisis, the political crisis being that the Roman Empire was crumbling about the Emperor Justinian. In the midst of a political crisis, when the seven trumpets of Revelation are taking the pagan Roman Empire apart piece by piece, Justinian entered into a religious argument. And the argument that had been going on is, is the church in Rome the number one Christian church or is the church in Constantinople the number one Christian church? And in order to solidify political power, Justinian, the, the civil authority, entered into the religious realm and identified the Pope of Rome as the corrector of heretics and uh, the head of the churches. And in so doing, civil authority was given to the papacy in 533. The seat was given to the papacy by pagan Rome in, the th in 330 and power from 496 onward. Pagan Rome gave three things to the papacy, it removed three things for the papacy. In Daniel 11, the first place that you see pagan Rome mentioned is in verse 14. The robbers of thy people shall establish the vision. But it is not until verse 16 that pagan Rome truly comes into that history and begins to conquer the world. And in verses 16 and 17 of Daniel 11, pagan Rome conquers Syria, Israel, and Egypt, and once it's conquered Egypt, it began to rule the world supremely for 360 years. But from verse 16 to verse 30 of Daniel 11, the subject is pagan Rome. Pagan Rome is the subject from verse 16 to 30 in Daniel 11. It's not until verse 31 that papal Rome becomes the subject and continues to be so until verse 45. Almost identical, almost identical. You know, the, in... Um, in terms of verses, just on the math, 16 to 30, what is that, 14 verses, 15 verses, if you count verse 16 itself, and from verse 31 to 45, 15 verses. Virtually the same amount of testimony for pagan Rome and papal Rome in Daniel 11. But in verse 30, uh, it says, and this is the bottom of page 39, if you're not following along in your Bible, it says, for the sh ships of Chittim shall come against him, against pagan Rome, Therefore he, pagan Rome, shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. If you have Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith, he will tell you that the ships of Chittim are the vandals of northern Africa. And who are the vandals of northern Africa in Bible prophecy? They are the second trumpet of the seven trumpets. So here we have a connection between Daniel and Revelation. The ships of Chittim is identifying that pagan Rome is in the history where the seven trumpets are tearing pagan Rome apart. Um, you'll see on the top of page 40, the second angel. This is the ships of Chitt Chittim. This is Genseric, the, the king of the Vandals. So in verse 30, uh, which we're, what we're going through now is verse 30, piece by piece, adding the different components of truth to try to, to clarify verse 30. Verse 30 would say, For the vandals shall come against pagan Rome, therefore pagan Rome shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant, so shall pagan Rome do. Pagan Rome shall return and have intelligence 
with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. And the first phrase I didn't read, I just quoted from memory and it was wrong. They shall have indignation against the Holy Covenant. Intelligence. Uh, of verse 30, a communication, a dialogue is opened up in verse 30 between pagan Rome and papal Rome. And as soon as that happens, pagan Rome ceases to be the subject of Daniel 11, and papal Rome takes the ascendancy. And brothers and sisters, it's not an accident. It's not the focus of this study. I can't spend time here. But it's not an accident that when Sister White is talking about the fulfillment of Daniel 11 in verses 40 to 45, that she says the same history that's in verses 30 to 36 will be repeated in verses 40 to 45. And the very starting point of that history is when a communication, a dialogue, a relationship was struck between pagan Rome and papal Rome. And when you get to verse 40, the very starting point of that history of the collapse of the Soviet Union is when a, a communication, a dialogue was struck between Ronald Reagan and the Pope of Rome, and the historical sources tell, tell us that the way this communication was carried out between the United States and the Vatican was how? The Central Intelligence Agency. So verse 30 is saying, intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant, and when it's paralleled here, here at the end, the organization that accomplished this act was the Central Intelligence Agency. So they're going to have communication with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. And you'll see in the middle of page 40, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4, the papacy is the, the church that falls away. The papacy in prophetic history is, uh, this is identifying the time of Pergamos that precedes the time of Thyatira. It's, it's the time of compromise, when the Christian church compromises and falls away from the truth. They forsake the Holy Covenant. So in verse 30, when it says pagan Rome would have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant, it's saying pagan Rome was going to open up a dialogue with the Vatican, the papacy. So um, once that takes place in verse 30, from this point on, the papacy is the subject. In verse 31, it says, an arm shall stand on his part. This is verse 31. The his part is not pagan Rome. It's the papacy. It's switched. The papacy took ascendancy over pagan Rome during the dialogue that took place. Is there, is there ever a time when, when someone holds a, a dialogue with Satan and they come up on top of the situation? And that's just what's being described in verse 30. When pagan Rome, although pagan Rome's satanic tool as well. But when pagan Rome opened up intelligence with the papacy, it, it went down and the papacy ascended. And in verse 30, it says, arm shall stand on his part. This is pagan Rome. And they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, shall remove paganism. We've already established that. And they shall place the abomination that make it desolate. The his part is the papacy. Uh, you can see that illustrated in the very last um, quote on verse 40, and what we're doing is we're going through this verse and we're substituting the definitions for the, the symbols in the verse. The arms, and on page 41, top of the page, the arms that stood up for the papacy in agreement with the other passages of prophecy are the arms, the military strength of these seven European kings. So verse 31 is saying, the seven European kings, the arms, shall stand up for the papacy. They'll pollute the sanctuary strength and shall remove paganism. They stood up, as we've already got noted up here, from 496 to 508. And uh, I hope you're seeing that we are going to different passages, Daniel 7, Daniel 12, Daniel 11, to describe different aspects of the identical history upon the testimony of two, a thing is established. Revelation 13. These are different passages identifying the same history. The seven European kings, in verse 31, the arms are the seven European kings. And if you dissect, um, I did, as you can tell when you're listening to me speak, that when I took English in grammar school and high school, I did very poorly. Okay, I don't have a grasp of the English language, even though it is is my language, but I remember, and I'm sure you do, that when you were taking your English classes, they had you dissect the different sentences and identify what they were. That's where I really fell down, obviously. But if you take verse 31 and you dissect it, okay, 
the arms, the seven European kings, in verse 31, if you read it enough till, till you see it, the arms are going to do four things for the papacy. The papacy is his part. They're going to stand up for the papacy. That's one thing the arm's going to do. They're going to pollute the sanctuary of strength. They're going to remove the daily. And they're going to place the abomination that maketh desolate. Each of those actions, the standing up for the papacy, the polluting the sanctuary of the strength, the removing the daily, the placing the abomination of desolate, are four actions that the seven European kings, the arms, do for the papacy. So we'll look at those. Um, they'll stand up. We have that uh, on number one. Number two, they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. We've already looked a little bit in an earlier presentation that in Daniel 11, um, 24, there is a time prophecy on how long pagan Rome would rule the world supremely. And if you look closely at the Hebrew in the last phrase of verse 24 of Daniel 11, it says, it, he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. And we pointed out that the Bible commentators and Uriah Smith and Daniel and Revelation says that this word against in this phrase would be better translated as from. And it says pagan Rome shall forecast their devices from its stronghold for 360 years. And the stronghold, the prophetic stronghold for pagan Rome is the city of Rome. And, and, and there's an easy logic to see this. In this time prophecy in verse 24, we know that it began when at the Battle of Actium in 31 BC. Uriah Smith says so in Daniel and Revelation. Historians confirm it. 360 years later, in the year 330, Constantine moved the cap from the city of Rome to the city of Constantinople. So we know that this time prophecy on how long pagan Rome would rule the world supremely, it has a direct historical connection with the city of Rome. Once they moved the capital out of the city of Rome, they ceased to rule the world supremely. So when the pioneers are saying the sanctuary of strength for pagan Rome is the city of Rome, there's prophetic and historical evidence to make that argument. It's the same with the papacy. The, the sanctuary of strength for, for the papacy is the city of Rome. It was, it, what begins the time period of the papacy ruling the world supremely is when the Goths are driven out of the city of Rome leaving the city of Rome in the hand of the papacy. And what brings the 1260 years to an end? When Napoleon has his general take the pope out of the city of Rome. The city of Rome, whether it makes sense or not, the city of Rome is the prophetic sanctuary of strength for Rome in Bible prophecy. And in verse 31, it says that these seven European kings are going to pollute the sanctuary of strength. And in Uriah Smith's book, the, he points to two actions. In, in your notes, I have the year 330. He says that if you want to say that Constantine cast down and polluted the city of Rome in the year 330, that's acceptable understanding. And then he goes on to say, as other pioneers do, that from the year 330, after Constantine had moved the capital, that's when the seven trumpets begin to blow and the disintegration of pagan Rome into ten kingdoms and fulfillment of Daniel 7 takes place as this warfare is taking place in the Roman Empire. And the point of attack in the warfare of the, the time period of the trumpets, the, the coveted prize by the, the barbarians from the north and the, the vandals of northern Africa, what they were after was the city of Rome. So during that history... There were, was battle after battle carried out in the city of Rome. So another way that the seven European kings, because they were the ones involved with this warfare, another way that the seven European kings, the arms of verse 31, polluted the sanctuary of strength, the city of Rome, was by the warfare that was carried out in that city during that history. Um, and it says that they shall remove paganism. The seven European kings are going to remove paganism. And by the year 508, Arthur, king of England, final of the seven European kings, removed paganism as its legal religion um, in its kingdom. And paganism had been removed from those kings. And, ver and number four, they're going to place the papacy, the abomination that make it desolate, they're going to place the papacy on the throne of the earth in the year 538. So... If you, if you dissect verse 31, you'll see that these different phrases, not only are they describing four actions of pagan Rome, these actions 
have actual histories that you can assign to them. When it says the arms will stand up, the arms of pagan Rome stood up from 496 to 508. The arms will pollute the sanctuary of strength. If you want to say that the, they polluted the sanctuary of the strength in the year 330, that's fine. That's a history. If you want to say they polluted the, the sanctuary of strength during the warfare that ensued, you can say the warfare st- from 330 to 476. In the year, the year 476, from that point on, there was never a Roman that ruled in the city of Rome after 476. It had been totally conquered. There's historical prophetic history to go along with each of these actions. When it says the arms will remove the daily, that prophetic history is 496 to 508. The arms, the seven European kings placed the abomination that make it desolate, that's 538. Each of these phrases are anchored in history, in sound prophetic history. So when you go back and you start looking for a testimony of two, it says arms shall, arms shall stand up. You have Revelation 13 2, which says... Pagan Rome is going to give its power to the papacy. That's an agreement with verse 31. The arms shall stand up. In Daniel 8, 12, it says, A host was given him against the daily. This host, military strength, was given the papacy. Verse 12 is speaking about the papacy. In Daniel 8, 12, at the bottom of page 41 in your notes, it says, A host, an army, was given him, the papacy, against the daily. By reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and it's prospered. Daniel 8, 12. It's talking about the papacy. It's, it's saying that there comes a point in time where the papacy practiced and prospered, and it cast the truth to the ground. That's the 1260 years. And what allowed the papacy to get in the position to do that is that a host, an army, a military strength was given the papacy. And we know who did it. The seven European kings did it from the year 496 to 508. But verse 12 is not being redundant. Verse 12 is is nailing down another important truth to this history. Verse 12 of Daniel 8 is saying the way that these, the the transgression that took place when these seven European kings um, came to the aid of the papacy, something took place that verse 12 calls a transgression. And the transgression that's being emphasized in verse 12 is what we call the combination of church and state. This was the transgression of desolation, the the emphasis on church and state with the papacy in control of the relationship. Um, In, on page 42, if you go back to, uh, we dissect, Verse 12 of Daniel 8, and I just went through that very quickly. Um, it says, it, this transgression, they were given a host against, the, against paganism. In verse 12, I, I, I missed this. I need, to, I need to factor this into verse 12. It says, and a host, an army, military strength, the seven European kings. I'm on the top of page um, 42, if you're following along in your notes. A military power was given the papacy. The seven European kings, in verse 12, gave their military strength to the papacy. Against the daily, if you remember, in Daniel 7, pagan Rome disintegrated into ten kingdoms. And pagan Rome, what, were, what, what religion was pagan Rome? Paganism. So all ten of these horns are paganism. And I realize that there's an aspect of the, the Hurali, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals that we need to emphasize they were Aryans because this was a uh, a philosophical struggle between them and Catholicism. But the bottom line is, is all of these ten nations, first off, were pagan. So if when verse 12 says, the seven European kings gave their military to the strength to the papacy against the daily, the work that these seven European kings did for the papacy is being identified in verse 12. They were going to use their military strength against the paganism of the Heroli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals. And why were they going to use it for the papacy against them? Because those three horns had to be removed before the papacy could be placed on the throne and practice and prosper and cast the, the truth to the ground. The verse, when you see the verse, it's consistent with itself. It's, it's talking about the, several aspects of the very same history. Um, 
So Daniel 8.11, down at the bottom of the page. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. This is identifying pagan Rome. Pagnifi pagan Rome magnified itself to Christ. And by pagan Rome, the daily sacrifice was taken away. The next page, we follow the counsel of Sister White on the top of page 43, and we remove the word sacrifice that, by pagan sacrifice from the verse. By pagan Rome, the daily was taken away. And that we know the daily is paganism. So verse 12 is saying, by pagan Rome, paganism was taken away. And we know that the word translated as take away in the verse is to lift up and exalt. So pagan Rome lifted up, up and exalted paganism. It's not Kodesh, but Mikdash. So the place of his sanctuary is the place where the pagan sanctuary is located, which is the city of Rome. And in verse 11 of Daniel 8, it says, the city of Rome, the place of the pagan sanctuary, the Mikdash sanctuary of pagan Rome was cast down, and it was cast down by Constantine in the year 330. And this is the same action that is identified in Revelation 13 too, when it says the dragon pagan Rome gave its seat of authority, its, its place of rule to the papacy in the year 330. Um, We're moving very quickly. I, I believe, you know, I, I've been sharing this stuff now for several days before I got here, too. We did go over the time prophecy in level 24 already, haven't we? Briefly. We mentioned that yesterday, correct? Correct? Yeah, nobody's remembering. Uh, page 44. Um, we've, we've mentioned it before more than once. If you dissect page... On page 44, Daniel eleven twenty four, Uriah Smith, as a point of reference in his book, which Sister White calls God's Helping Hand, tells us that verse 24 of Daniel 11 is dealing with pagan Rome. So verse 24 of Daniel 11 is saying, pagan Rome shall enter peaceably upon the fattest places of the province, and pagan Rome shall do that which his fathers has not done, nor his father's fathers. Pagan Rome shall scatter among them the prey and the spoil and the riches, yea, and pagan Rome shall forecast pagan Rome's devices against the strongholds even for 360 years. And then the next, the next representation of that verse, we've mentioned the, the Bible scholars and Uriah Smith say this word against is better translated from pagan Rome is going to forecast its devices from its stronghold. And the stronghold we've been dealing with, consistent with these other verses, is the city of Rome. So you see that represented in the next breakdown of verse 24. Pagan Rome shall forecast its devices from the city of Rome for 360 years. This 360-year time prophecy is a specific focus of prophecy because if, as you see in the middle of page 44, you have Di Daniel 8, 9. Daniel 8, 9 says, And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great towards the south, towards the east, towards the pleasant land. This is identifying the three areas of conquest for pagan Rome, Syria, Israel, and Egypt. It had to conquer those three before it could rule the world supremely. And the third of those was Egypt, the Battle of Actium, 31 BC. Thus begins this 360-year time prophecy of verse 24. So you're seeing here, um, Daniel 8, 9 has a connection to verse 24. And then you'll see verses 16 and 17 of Daniel 11, which is just another testimony to the three uh, geographical areas that pagan Rome need to overcome before it took control of the world supremely. Syria, Israel, Egypt, and once Egypt was con conquered at the Battle of Actium, it ruled for 360 years, which brings you to the year 330, when, according to Daniel 11, the place of pagan Rome sanctuary was cast down, or according to Revelation 13, the dragon gave the papacy its seat. These themes in Daniel and Revelation have several connections with different verses if you follow them through. So you'll see the summation of verse 24 at the bottom of the page. And uh, if you... When you get, brothers and sisters, we need, to, we need to become familiar with these verses because these verses are, um, these verses 
are identifying the work of pagan Rome in placing the papacy upon the throne of the earth. And as a test question for all of you here this morning, what does Daniel 11, 14 tells, tell us? That Rome establishes the vision. So we need to be familiar with the prophetic testimony concerning Rome because it establishes the vision. It doesn't simply establish the vision of past history. Pagan Rome is a type of the United States. Pagan Rome placed the papacy on the throne of the earth. Um, the United States is going to place the papacy on the throne of the earth. As an example, and there, there are many, and truly many, if, if you doubt that there are many, then I would challenge you to obtain the 40-hour prophecy school that we have available. If you, if you look at the 40-hour prophecy school, you will see that there are many very sound um, end-of-the-world applications that we draw to all of these things. To 533, there is an end-of-the-world application to 533. And, and there's just, when you see it, there's no way to shake it. It's, it's testimony about the end of the world. There is an end-of-the-world application to the year 330, no doubt about it. There's an end-of-the-world application to 496 to 508. It's, it's just there. Um, give you an example of one. Clovis, pagan king. One of the things that Clovis did is he began the work of placing the papacy on the throne of the earth through his military and economic strength. But one of the historical manifestations, one of the, the part of the historical record about Clovis is that he changed his religious profession from paganism to Catholicism as he began this work. Brothers and sisters, in the Ronald Reagan years, the United States, whether it understands it or not, it ceased to be a Protestant nation. And it changed to apostate Protestantism. Because in the Ronald Reagan years, we formed a secret alliance with the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. And the Bible teaches, can two walk together unless they be agreed? And up to that time, the United States still could cling to the, the title that it was a Protestant nation. And there's only one definition for Protestantism, and it's to protest Rome. And you cannot protest Rome if you're walking with Rome. In the Ronald Reagan years, among other things, Ronald Reagan paralleled the work of Clovis. He changed professions from Protestantism to apostate Protestantism. And what did Ronald Reagan do at that time? He brought the military might and the economic might into the United States into the position where it began to place the papacy on the throne of the earth. Clovis is a type of Ronald Reagan. It's, there's just no way to get around it, and there's other, there are other um, arguments to bring to that. Uh, an interesting one, and, I, and I'm not, dog, I don't think this is, this is just interesting for you to consider. Seven European kings had to come to the aid of the papacy before the process, this prophetic process was complete. Um, but it's not going to be seven nations at the end of the world that place the papacy on the throne of the earth. Who places the papacy on the throne of the earth at the end? The United States. But that process began with Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan was a two-term president, and George Bush I was a one-term president, and Bill Clinton was a two-term president, and the current Bush is a two-term president. I wonder if that means anything, brothers and sisters, about how close we are to the Sunday law or to placing the papacy on the throne of the earth. These histories begin to bring some kind of direction to what's going on in the world today, and I'm not too dogmatic about that one, but it can't be passed by. There's something... Uh, Something alarming with, with the fact of where we are in Earth's history when you start considering other prophetic issues that it's in the time period of George Bush II that the third woe has arrived in history and the third woe is the power that torments and kills modern Babylon based upon the first and second woe. And they're already here. We're at the time period, brothers and sisters, where our responsibility of Seventh-day Adventists is to write the vision and make it plain that he who readeth may run. And the vision is about at the end of the world. It's not Daniel 8.14 announcing the beginning of judgment. It's about a Daniel 11.41 announcing the end of judgment. The Sunday law is about to arrive. And we have to be clear about that. And the only way we can be clear about that is by understanding that it is Rome that establishes the vision. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for being with us so far in this presentation, helping us to, to see some of these
prophetic realities in a way that allows us to understand what's going on around us. Uh, we know as your people that we have a responsibility to uh, send this message down the line when we hear it, and we ask that you'd open the doors for us to do that. We ask that you would accompany this uh, work that we're doing in putting this information on uh, tape, that uh, you would bless it, that it might be clear for those that hear it far and wide, and that it might bring an appropriate response in the lives of those that hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>